hundreds of people are here today, which is wonderful and attests to how well known Kate is um, as a scholar of the social and political implications of artificial intelligence. Kate is a senior uh, principal researcher at Microsoft and recently um, became a research professor at the University of California's Annenberg School. My name is Judy Wiseman and I lead the Women in Data Science and AI project at the Alan Turing Institute and we're part of the public policy group. Our project highlights the lack of diversity in the AI industry, but also crucially makes links between this and the gender, race and other social biases that Kate's book so squarely addresses. We only have an hour with Kate today. Um, I wish we had many hours and I hope we'll get a chance to do this in person on another occasion. Um, but everyone is very welcome to participate through the chat function. Um, please post your questions in the Q&A and I'll keep an eye on them and I'll try and integrate as many as I can as we uh, go along today. Today's event will be subtitled. If you can't see the subtitles, hit the CC button on the bottom toolbar of your screen. Okay. Um, I know um, not many of you will have had a chance to read Kate's book because it's only literally just been launched. It occurred to me, you know, that I think it's just literally come out in the UK in the last couple of days, actually. Um, so I thought I would um, start by just um, very quickly telling you why I, I so welcome the book. I have to say that I nodded all the way through, you know, as I do, um, because it's such a rich illustration really of taking a science and technology studies perspective to look at a new, new developments in technology. And it's done with a suitably kind of Marxist inflection. So, you know, for me, it's the kind of perfect um, lens uh, with which to uh, think about these things. Okay, so very quickly, for a start, what I love about the book is that it's historical. In every chapter, you, lo you locate technological developments in the historical context of their emergence and show how these origins are embedded in the technologies themselves, whether it's facial recognition or emotion recognition, that you rightly stress throughout the book that we need to understand where these systems come from to understand how they function. So I'm totally sort of with you on that. I mean, history as well, taking a historical approach really reminds us that we've had a lot of these discussions uh, in early, with earlier technological revolutions. And, you know, I, I came into this work during the microelectronic uh, revolution of the 1980s. And I remember well then the debates about the impact of technology um, being at this simple dichotomous debate about whether they're, um, you know, utopian or dystopian. We had a lot of that discussion. And in a way, the field of science and techno technology studies was really trying to address the technological determinism that sort of was underlying uh, those debates to very much emphasize that technology is an autonomous, but is always shaped by social, political and economic forces. And as you make so clear, Kate, human choices are embedded in the very design or architecture. I mean, as we say nowadays, the materiality of technology, whether it's hardware or software, you know, Langdon Winners bridges or AI systems. Secondly, um, I, I was very intrigued and absolutely um, persuaded by you adopting an atlas or map as your lens. I had to think about that a lot because I'm much better on time than on space, <laughs> uh, you know, but I actually think it's it's it, it's terrific um, lens um, because it enables you to extend the, the uh, notion of infrastructure to include the planetary infrastructure. The dual operation of abstraction and extraction in information capitalism, as Hart and Negri uh, put it, that includes the cost of natural resources and its labor process. So in the fine Marxist tradition of exposing commodity fetishism, you expose the material conditions of the production of AI, its whole life trajectory, the birth, life and death of an AI system from minerals and energy, via a global supply chain of labor to the way corporations and the state operationalize it and its impact on our lives. Like all technologies, AI is not artificial. It's very much um, man-made, if I can say so. Um, 
Thirdly, I very much like the way you argue that to call AI intelligent, and I think this is crucial to the whole book really, is to invoke a very narrow definition of intelligence, one that flattens the complexity of lived experience. AI systems operate according to the normative logic of mathematical optimization across a variety of domains, such as education, health, welfare, credit, criminal justice. And the result is that only what can be measured counts. It's governance through numbers. And your key point really is that while these AI systems appear as rational and objective, and in a way that legitimates um, their use, that's the crucial legitimation of their use, they're ultimately designed to serve existing dominant interests. In this sense, you say AI is a registry of power. What the book does superbly, I mean, superbly is I'm, I'm completely with you on all these arguments, so you know, um, is not to argue that these trends are kind of uh, completely new, but rather that the massive accumulation of behavioral trace data has fundamentally intensified and amplified these trends. So I'd like to begin just by asking you when you became aware of these massive changes, because you know you were there right at the beginning and you sussed out that this was one of the most crucial um, issues facing us now. And you know, how did you know that this was like totally the perfect moment to bring out this book? It's like we've been wanting someone to bring this stuff together. A lot of us who've been researching this area and thinking thinking about it. And you've you've written this beautiful book that kind of absolutely brings it together in an accessible, such an accessible, clear and convincing way. So tell us about your journey. Well, Judy, I have to say that is the most generous and overwhelmingly uh, just wonderful introduction thank you i mean particularly because i've been such a fan of your work for so long since way back when you when you first published I think social shaping of technology was one of the books that was like prominent on my bookshelf in the 90s and of course everything since including press for time which i write about in atlas of ai so it it's a, means a great deal to me to be here in conversation with you today um, i'd also like to say a big thank you to the alan turing institute for hosting us but you know you, you asked this question of you know of timing how could i know that this would be the right year 2021 we've come through a pandemic we've seen the intensification of all of these logics that you've beautifully articulated you know i wish i could say i did <laughs> the truth is that this book took a long time to write over five years um, and there's no way that i could have imagined that the themes that i saw then would have become so present um, it really is as quickly as they have for me it was really the great fortune of joining microsoft research in 2012 which is around the same time as convolutional neural nets were taking central stage deep learning was accelerating and certainly we were seeing industrial research labs really invest in machine learning in a new way. Wow. And it was really clear at that point that everything from computer vision to natural language processing was going to be radically changed. But at the same time, there were very real problems. And we can think about these problems as, as a life cycle. We can think about the ways in which AI systems require so much computation. In fact, they're becoming increasingly computationally intensive. And so many of our consumer AI devices, be it phones or laptops, use enormous amounts of these minerals that everything from rare earth to cobalt to lithium. And then of course, the data that drives AI must be labeled by people on remote work platforms in places like Ghana and the Philippines. And then finally, they get applied in these highly tailorized work environments where algorithmic management systems are brought to bear on workers every day. So you can see this full tangible system of AI having a much more profound and material impact in the world than simply thinking about it as abstract computation or immaterial algorithms. So part of really what I wanted to do in this book was to situate these systems in sort of the specific locations and institutions around the world that are actually deploying them. Very nice. And so I think it's, it's most appropriate that you start the book by telling us about your sort of journey and describe your journey um, to visit a lithium mine in um, Nevada where you can say you can see AI as an extractive industry in its most literal sense. I mean, I must say, as we're both Australians, we both understand how important mining is to politics, you know, that it's, to put it mildly, it's, it was very nice you start with the mining. But, you know, I, I wanted to ask you um, to tell us about that, but also, you know, 
what you think about the fact that in a way during this COVID crisis, we've been kind of reassuring ourselves that actually our carbon footprint is going down. And yet you very much stress that all this kind of zooming that we're doing like now is, is, is taking up an enormous amount of energy. Mm, exactly right. I mean, you know, it's interesting for me to, one of the things that people have asked, it's like, why did you open a book about artificial intelligence at a lithium mine? And it yeah. was precisely because, you know, in order to ground artificial intelligence, in order to truly understand these material impacts, we have to go to the places where it's made. And I mean, made in the fullest sense. So that for me meant going to the last functioning lithium mine in the US, which is in Nevada in a place called Silver Peak, where you can see these gigantic lithium brine pools and the sort of iridescent green color sort of drying in the sun, producing uh, essentially the, the stuff, the gray gold as it's referred to, yeah. that becomes lithium iron batteries. And those lithium ion batteries, are, of course, are in high demand, you know, we have them in iPhones, but also in, you know, Tesla cars and EVs, but we have a very serious supply problem. In fact, I'm sure, as you saw, the Biden administration just recently released a, a crisis document saying we have to essentially secure the supply chain for so many of the minerals that drive current information yeah. capitalism and planetary computation. So it's very timely right now to think about just how much of this sort of material is required to make the sorts of AI systems that we just expect to work every day are actually poised on this brink in terms of how do we think about the usability of these minerals, but also their geopolitics. Yeah. Okay, now the next chapter, I'm going to try and get through as much as I can. I mean, the chapter three is on uh, the many different forms of labor that are involved in making AI, um, from miners to content moderators to Amazon warehouse workers to engineers in Silicon Valley. And I love this chapter as well. I'm going to say this with every chapter. I mean, I found it really refreshing because, you know, I've spent a lot of my time in the last few years on these panels about the future of work. I was on one just actually last week. Um, with the guy from MIT, you know, David Otter talking about, you know, technology in the future of work. And, and, you know, so often economists, not him, he's the exception actually, you know, tell me that robots will soon do everything and there won't be any kind of jobs left at all. And as you quite rightly say, and he and I say, you know, what's, what's you know, that that debate is off the point in a way. And what's more important is to look at the experience of the work now Mm. and how these technologies are kind of facilitating increased surveillance and algorithmic management systems. And I want to come on to that in a minute. Well, I wonder if you might say something quickly about the importance of ghost work, um, as Gray and, and, and Suri call it, because it seems to me that's an important thing to, to highlight as well. I'm so glad you mentioned the work of Mary Gray and Sid Suri, and, and, and certainly ghost work, I think, is an incredibly important book at illuminating what it's like to you know be an, a person working on a remote work platform i mean these are jobs which are really digital piecework you're being paid very little um these are sort of you know sub poverty level wages for doing work that can be extremely tedious um and, and extremely stressful so certainly you know we've seen you know many scholars from lilia rani to yeah. uh i'm thinking here also of of the wonderful work of astra taylor she uses the term photomation the the, the way in which we assume automation, but in actual fact, it's people propping up these systems. And this is something that has been emerging for some time. And, and certainly when it comes to AI, um, in your work on digital assistance, you know, I know you saw these, these same patterns emerging and you know, how much of this system is actually faked by using people all along the supply chain, actually doing these, these quite mundane tasks. And in the book, I write about a system called XAI, where they actually had people pretending to be digital assistants, um, doing you know fourteen-hour days, you know that sort of ex really quite painful work conditions, but again to give the impression of yeah. seamless. AI. So, you know, this is something that, again, I, I think your work has been pointing to for some time, but is well and truly in the ascendant now. Yes, and we could, um, you know, talk about the kind of socio-imaginary of Silicon Valley and, and those issues for a long time and the role these things play. But I want to um, move on, you know, to a, a bit of detail about this chapter. I mean, you begin the chapter um, with the image of a large time clock in an, in, an, in an Amazon warehouse that I know you visited. 
And you use that image to trace the long history of the use of automation to control time. Um, you know, through authors like E.P. Thompson and Braverman and through Taylorism, scientific management, Fordism, you know, this is all my, my material, you know, the, the stuff of my life, if you like. Um, I wondered if you could tell us about um, a little bit more about the use of algorithmic management systems at both ends of the labour market, on the one hand, in terms of kind of platform work, and at the other end, uh, which is what I've been studying, um, at, you know, at, at, about knowledge work and how that's being um, transformed. Right, and I love the way you've asked this question because, of course, we know we have to think about algorithmic management both in terms of the way that it's been introduced in low-wage work and what's traditionally understood as blue-collar jobs, all the way through to highly paid white-collar employment. And and this is interesting the degree to which you know you can certainly trace these systems back. I mean, Charles Babbage, of course, who is you know known best for the Difference Engine, used to also write a lot of social theory, and you know one of his visions for the future was that you know we would have systems that would be highly efficient, that would yeah. be watching workers and yeah. tracking every minute of what they do in order to make sure they're being used most efficiently. And it's a, it's a somewhat horrific vision, but it's certainly come to pass in some of the systems that we're seeing today. Spending time inside an Amazon fulfillment center was, for me, just, you know, absolutely horrifying. I mean, these are sort of used as the exemplars of workplaces that combine automation, both of the algorithmic variety and robots with people. Yeah. But they're also exemplars of something else, of precisely the kind of extraordinary psychological and physical pressure of working under those conditions. And I'm sure you saw just last month, Jeff Bezos said that one of their responses to increased injury and stress in these work environments is to introduce, introduce a new algorithmic management system that will be tracking workers down to the level of the ligaments and muscles that they're using to try and produce new efficiencies. Now, right. to me, this is this is yeah. Babbage's vision brought to yeah. life and, yeah, and it's absolutely. quite nightmarish. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's so like Taylorism as well, isn't it? And the absolutely. stopwatch and um, pure that Taylorism. Really and, and what about the other end in terms of kind of knowledge workers? Because I'm mm. sort of with you on, you know, the, the the fact that we need to really kind of focus on, you know, that the, that the change in a way is the increased granular, granularity of kind of tracking and nudging and assessment that the machine um, tools, machine learning tools facilitate. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of myself very worried about this in the context of the shift to working from home, right? Mm. But given that, won't that act as a spur to increasing kind of surveillance um, of knowledge workers through these tools. And I mean, the, the, the worst thing you described very well in your chapter on emotion um, detection software would be to that extent. So as you say, it would be bodily movements, but emotional states and all of those things. Do you have a sense as well that this current kind of moment of the COVID crisis will be a spur to increasing that kind of surveillance of knowledge workers? It's already happened. So okay. certainly in the last in the last 18 months, we've seen an enormous uptick in services that offer to essentially track workers through cameras, through uh, tracking how many times they send emails, uh, sit in meetings, and to come up with efficiency scores that they use to compare to other remote workers. Um, certainly the, the many startups and companies that offer this have seen an enormous increase in their services. Similarly, we've seen other companies like Four Little Trees offer to do essentially emotion detection, as it's called, mm -hmm. called detection in scare quotes here, yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, of young students who are working, again, studying at home, trying to engage with classwork, and using cameras to detect micro expressions in their faces to see if they're paying attention and to try and sort of, if you will, in, infer a type of internal emotional state. Now, certainly something that I spent quite a lot of time studying for the purposes of this book and have a chapter on it is looking yeah. at just how problematic this assumption is that you can look at somebody's face and know their internal state. This desire to create an AI polygraph, if you will, I think is fundamentally broken at its very taproot in terms of the ideas and theories that inform it and in terms of the systems that seek to implement it. So absolutely, this is one of the domains where I think we urgently need regulation because certainly under the pandemic, we've seen these systems move ever deeper into the tools of everyday work.
Yes, I mean, maybe we can come back to the regulation because I do want to ask you about that, but I want to quickly move on to your terrific chapters on um, data and classification, because here's really where your own work has been absolutely sort of path breaking. So I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time as the author of Press for Time, <laughs> um, and I really want to get on to this. So let me just um, start with data, actually. Um, you look at them, you know, you talk about the massive harvesting of data that's really driving the success of AI. Can you tell us, and um, we've got a very varied audience um, here of, of so many people, you know, how do training data sets actually work? And perhaps tell us um, about the problems of labeling encountered by the army of piecemeal workers who do this work. Mm. Well, uh, you know, put very briefly, sort of supervised and unsupervised machine learning systems are built by using large amounts of data to essentially represent the world. We call this training data. And training data, in a sense, becomes sort of the ground truth of how systems will actually function. So for me, one of the things that's been so revealing and interesting is to really study, to really look at how training data works, to open up, if you will, the training data sets and see not just the data within them, but the logic in terms of how it's classified and ordered. And, and here, I think was just such a, a revelation to me was to, to understand that this sort of excavation, as we call it, is yeah. so rare that, that ultimately for, you know, for so many training data sets, they're simply used as aggregate infrastructures, you know, applied, don't think too much about it, um, and use it to create models for machine learning. But herein lies a very real problem, because once you actually start looking closely at how these systems work, once you start conducting these sort of archaeologies of training data, you find all sorts of problems, not just in terms of the ways in which people are being classified into, you know, binary gender or, you know, five part categorizations of race, you know, things that are profoundly broken and, and understood as such, but also making sort of moral judgments uh, of, of people's characters based on their appearance. I mean, there are so many problems with these, these type of um, almost sort of will to phrenology that we see in, in systems today, that certainly it's, it's at the level of training data where you can start to see those classifications and where they come from. Okay, yes, absolutely. Um, you, you talk about in this chapter, and I was very struck by this, that data is now treated as a natural resource to be mined and extracted. And I like the mined and extracted, um, you know, from the mining, from the, from the literal mining to the, to the data being treated in this way. And you talk about how there's a kind of moral imperative, I mean, as, as Marion Foucault and Karen Healy put it, to collect more data because we can, you know, it's there for the collecting. So it's kind of a moral imperative to keep um, doing this. And how this is related to the idea that the more data we have, the more knowable the person. That we have now um, a kind of data double, or as Luke Stark calls it, a scalable um, subject being created of all of us. I wonder if you could explain what you mean by that, elaborate on that for us. Well, I mean, I think that's that's a you know, interestingly, a, a formulation that that's been a long time coming. So this sort of ideology that more is better is something that you can see really going back to sort of the late twentieth century and sort of the very early AI labs. And this is something that the media historian Chao Cheng Li has documented beautifully in her work about the IBM Continuous Speech Recognition Lab, where Robert Mercer, this is yes, the same Robert Mercer, you know, who funded the Trump campaign and, you know, many other things besides, um, back when he was actually a research scientist, said that more data is always better data. And indeed, so what we see at that time in history is a shift away from the sorts of expert systems approaches and symbolic logic that were previously sort of dominant in AI towards sort of probabilistic methods and, and brute force approaches. So certainly from that time to now, you've seen this development of this ideology that we should always capture 
as much data as possible, even if you don't know what it's for or you, 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 it's actually presenting forms of liability to you to be holding this data, that it was going to have this value, this kind of this, this value in its form, even if you couldn't quite see it yet. And I think what we have to see now is that this is actually a really problematic approach and it's, it's produced this kind of over collection of data. It's produced a situation where, again, people are profoundly concerned about the way in which data sets are being combined to produce what we've called in the past predictive privacy harms in a paper with Jason Schultz. So certainly I think here, this, this way in which data has been figured and understood has actually led us to a very problematic point in computational history. Yes, and I also think that, you know, what's interesting is how this kind of accumulation of data is affecting our own subjectivity. I mean, I know this is a, a topic for another time, but, you know, the, the self-optimization that somehow built into you know, the accumulation of data of the self. And you've written very nicely sort of about that. And, and I love your paper, actually. I, I can't remember it now, but I do use it for teaching, where you start with um, weight scales and go through talking mm -hmm. about, you know, the accumulation of information and how that actually affects your own sense of embodiment and, and how you're functioning in the world. Um, but maybe we should move on. I, I can see there's lots of questions as well. So I did um, want to get on to privacy issues of which there's sort of so many. And of course, one of the things that people um, are very concerned about when they talk about data doubles is of course that we're never sort of consulted about the use of our data and how it circulates and how it's extracted. And I remember um, Morozov some years ago talking, trying to um, campaign for us being paid for our data and kind of all of those discussions. But perhaps um, as we're at the Turing, what might be more interesting is how you talk about the problem that there's a lack of standard practices to note where data comes from mm -hmm. and how that's particularly a problem um, given that many of the data, given the private ownership of many data sets, you know, that, that when there's public data sets, I mean, you say you've looked at hundreds of data sets and they must be in the public realm. I right. mean, what should we do about this business, of, you know, about the fact that most of these data sets are actually not in the public realm and therefore not accessible to people like you examining them? Hmm. I mean, this is a very real problem. And, and honestly, I mean, I can still remember sort of early conversations a few years ago with Timnit Gebru, who at that time uh, was a postdoc with us at MSR. Wow. Um, and we were marveling at the fact that there really is no sort of standard way in which we have any information about where a training data set came from. So, yeah. you know, the way in which you would have a data sheet for a piece of hardware that says, you know, you can only use a semiconductor at these temperatures, you know, in these sorts of conditions, there was nothing equivalent for how we use data. And that was the genesis of a paper that's called Data Sheets for Data Sets, which is attempting to articulate what are the sorts of criteria information history and provenance that we would need yeah. to understand what a data set is actually designed for and more importantly when it should no longer be used and and that is another thing that we really don't talk about enough is you know when these data sets should be deprecated and then what happens when they continue to have these afterlives in places like academic torrents long after they've been taken down and we've seen that happening um, just in the last couple of years where training data sets were seen to be problematic and the creators said yes we'll remove them but they continue to circulate and of course continue to inform many production level systems so that's problem number one but problem number two that you point to is the fact that we simply don't know how large or what's happening in terms of the construction of training data sets inside sort of the large technology companies these are things which are kept as very secret proprietary information. Um, and there are things that, again, as researchers, we do not get to see. So that raises a big question in terms of how might we understand the way that these systems are used to classify, to interpret, how they feed into the logics of ad tech, of insurance, of policing, and so forth. So that is a major, I think, research blocker in the field and something that we have to contend with. Right, well, that's a, a beautiful segue to your next chapter, which I, I think is, is a stunner, um, your one on classification. Um, so let me just ask you a bit about that. Um, you know, in that chapter, your core argument is that the process of classification, in this case, labeling taxonomies, is inherently political. And that's why narrow technical solutions to, to statistical bias and the quest to skew data to make it more fair, miss the point. 
I mean, I've been very intrigued by all these conferences on, you know, the fat conference fairness in, you know, and all of the technical attempts um, to reshape the data to somehow make it, it, it fair and equal. And I, I want to talk with you about how difficult that is, what the problems are in terms of, of thinking, you know, articulating the problem in those terms. And in that, in this um, chapter on classification, you make terrific use of Jeff Bowker and Sue Lee Starr's work on classifications as ordering systems that have huge epistemic power in shaping how we see the world. And, you know, reading the chapter, I was really reminded of early feminist work um, like Sandra Harding and uh, many other people on the role of scientific knowledge. You know, we did a lot of work early on, on, you know, what we used to call the sociology of scientific knowledge. And we were thinking then about um, how scientific knowledge actually constructs biological gender binaries in which women are defined by nature as inferior to men. Now, so I was thinking about that as you were talking about how AI systems, um, you, you know, assume, or one might even say build the and bake in construct gender, race, and sexuality as natural fixed biological categories. So I wondered if you could tell us a bit about that, um, which is kind of core, and perhaps um, by describing your ImageNet project with Trevor um, Paglin. Mm. Such a rich question, and that there are so many parts to it. I mean, to speak personally, I, I first started publishing research on the question of bias in large scale data systems back in, I think it was 2010. And certainly at that point, the view was that bias was a problem that could simply be addressed by collecting more data. So, you know, if we have an issue here, let's just get more data and we'll solve it. But of course, what we've seen over the last 10 plus years is actually the opposite is the case for extremely large scale data systems. We have many instances of bias. We could think of the way in which Apple's credit worthiness algorithms give consistently lower credit to women. We could think about the voice recognition systems that fail to recognize women. We could think about the uh, facial recognition systems that fail to recognize people with darker skin tones. I mean, it's there, there are countless examples now. But certainly one of the things, the ways in which my thinking has changed is to see bias almost as sort of the megafauna, sort of, you know, the, the, the large errors, these, these failure points of systems. But instead, I think we need to actually go a step below into the logics of construction, which I think are actually far more profound in shaping the way systems actually see the world. And in many cases, we won't see a failure point in the same way as a spectacular disaster. Rather, it becomes this kind of fine grained way in which people are understood, interpreted and valued. And you can see this in, in, in so many systems, you know, from hiring to criminal justice, the way that people are being assigned to, you know, whether it be, uh, again, gender, race, but it could also be a risk score, it could be a credit score. Where do these ideas come from? And how do they become baked into systems is a core problem for us. Now, certainly one of the extraordinary things we've seen in the last five years has been the focus on fairness, accountability, and transparency issues, things like the FACT conference. These, I think, are necessary interventions, mm -hmm. but they're not sufficient because they always, in many cases, we see many papers, factor these as purely technical problems that require mm -hmm. technical fixes without thinking about the way in which by ingesting the data from the past, we are absorbing those forms of structural inequality, bias and ways of seeing that are actually profoundly problematic. And, and that's certainly something that we saw working on the ImageNet project uh, with the artist Trevor Paglin. And, and certainly here it was, it was extraordinary to, to really, again, start to look at something as important as ImageNet. You know, when we began studying it, you know, it had been, it had been online for almost 10 years. It had complete, it was a colossus of image recognition, um, but certainly it, it really hadn't been studied at the level of what was happening in particular categories, particularly the people category, wow. where we found so many just deeply racist, misogynistic terms, but also, you know, terms that were just made no sense, terms that didn't have a visual analog, like describing somebody as a debtor or a friend or an acquaintance, you know, these ideas that, that are not part of how we'd understand a sort of a visual noun. So certainly one of the things we did was to start to open up these epistemic questions around how knowledge is being made and how classifications at that deep level need to be far more, I think, 
critically engaged with, both in the technical fields, but I think this is fundamentally a socio-technical question, which means you need different sorts of expertise around the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're difficult problems, aren't they? Because I mean, once you recognize that they're structural problems, then they're kind of very hard to fix. I mean, if, I, if, if we think about it, maybe you could elaborate a bit more on um, you know, Amazon's hire, automated hiring tool that, that was not selecting women. You sort of talk about mm -hmm. how that that's a difficult problem to fix in a way. Well, maybe you could talk about that because actually it's to do with embedded gender use of language. It's to do with all kinds of things that actually fiddling around with that app we're not going to fix. And where does it sort of lead you? I mean, this is particularly relevant to our um, gender project at Turing. You know, how does one kind mm -hmm. of deal with things like that that you can you know that these these examples come up and they get a lot of publicity you know like the you know the female voices um and and then there's a discussion about well should we um i i mean i know at apple they had a discussion about kind of neutral voice you know will we try and invent a voice um that doesn't that isn't identifiable as masculine or feminine feminine then there's an issue about accents i mean all of these things are sort of very difficult aren't they i mean if we take something like the um, recruitment as a as a mm. as an example, what do you think about that? Where does one go once one recognizes how how deep these kind of connections are? Well, I mean, this 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 would bring us back to our questions around what can be addressed technically and what has to be addressed through regulation. And of course, this is very timely because if we think about just in the last couple of months, you know, one of the well-known hiring companies, HireVue, uh, which was using emotion recognition in its sort of video interviews, uh, made a sort of big announcement that yes, they were listening to the criticism and they were going to devolve that from their systems, but yeah. they still use things like a vo a basically voice emotion detection, listening to your vocal tone and again, trying to decide you know, whether that says something about your character or your employability. So you know, again, at the level of hiring, I think we have lots of questions around who is valued, you know, who is the idea of, of the ideal subject? or the ideal employee. But I'm curious, in, in, yeah. in your project, yeah. Judy, you know, how do you see this in terms of, how do you deal with this in terms of the way that gender itself is also inflected in these systems? Do you see this as something that design can contribute to in terms of technical designs? Or is this something where we have to think in more kind of policy and regulatory terms? I mean, I, I think we have to do all of these things. You know, we have to do something about the, you know, the lack of diversity in the field, that there are so few that, you know, when you look at the leading um, machine learning conferences, that the number of women contributing there is kind of tiny, you know, that you've got a very skewed workforce. It's mainly a young male workforce. And I do think that is by no means a solution, but I, I've strongly argued, as you know, for decades that you can only, um, you know, design from your experience in a sense. And, it, and if there's a very narrow range of experience kind of feeding into design and systems, again, whether it's hardware or software, you get a very kind of limited use of imagination, creativity, it's not good for any of us. So I think that's very important. I mean, I also, you know, we're hoping to do some more work on organizational culture, because it seems to me that partly we need to get into organizations and, and see what's going on and why only certain kinds of work, workers feel comfortable in those organizations, why there's a kind of chilly um, climate in there. And I think if the, if, you know, the, that doing something about those things would really contribute to a kind of wider debate, both about kind of, um, you know, about regulation and, and also a more informed kind of citizenship, which I, you know, I wanted you to talk about, but, you know, a, a better, broader, <laughs> kind of public debate about these things and very much in terms of, you know, when do we want to use these systems and when don't we? And the difference between using these tools as part of recruitment, right? That, that human mm. resource management or a judge, of course, it's good to have more data, right? It's, of course, it's good to have more knowledge. But as I think Virginia Eubanks so well talks about in her book, where's the human discretion? Where's the judgment? You know, how do we, um, you know, combine these things and make decisions about when we want to use these systems and when we don't. But, you know, please, um, please elaborate yourself on these things, yes. Brilliant. And this is why I love talking with you about these topics, because I think there, there, there's so much in that in terms of thinking about how and where we vest the idea of creative 
innovation. And certainly for the last 15, 20 years, Silicon Valley has really told a story about technical innovation, that that has been yeah, lionized at all yeah. costs. You know, move yeah. fast and break things. You know, this is how we do things best. We, we create technical innovation. But we, what we haven't done, and I think what's been a, a real loss here, is thinking about the sorts of innovation around policy, around regulation, around law, around all of the sorts of sort of ethical frameworks and ways in which we could consider the social implications of these systems. These are not spaces that have had anything like the same amount of intent, you know, interest, investment, or, or sort of social focus. And, and we can see certainly the fruits of that now when we've, I think, in many ways overcapitalized on a highly technical vision of, you know, what counts. And, you know, you talk about, you know, it's important to have more data versus more information. You know, these are different things. And, you know, what, what constitutes information and, and, as you say, good judgment um, is, is something that is so important here. And, and this, of course, takes us back to to the history of of how systems get designed and I always think here of Lainey Dastin and Peter Gallison's work on objectivity, um, where they look sort of to the shift in mechanical objectivity, that moment when it was decided that through tools we would have, you know, a more truthful account of the world. Yeah. We've certainly had a, a, a moment where machine learning has been seen to be this sort of all purpose tool that can be applied to anything from welfare, as we saw in the case of Virginia Eubanks's book, and we see how that fails us, all the way through to criminal justice. And we could think of you know, ProPublica's work, and we could think of the work of, of the markup, looking at how these systems, again, are failing us there. So we, we have a decision to make, which is how are we going to use the next 10 years? And, and where do we really need innovation and creativity. And I would suggest that that is where we need to be thinking is around policy, is around public debate, and is around regulation. And, and I am optimistic because I'm starting to see certainly some very positive signs in those areas. Um, and as we've seen, of course, in the EU, we've seen the first omnibus draft regulations for AI. Uh, and there too, may, perhaps still early days, imperfect, but a step in the right direction in thinking about how do we regulate these systems better. But I wanted to ask you more about ethics, actually, because you have a very nice mm -hmm. um, line, of course, uh, you know, in the book about, you know, too much focus in a way having been on ethics and not enough about power. I mean, I think this is why, yes, why, you know, that we should be focusing less on ethics and more on power. And you mentioned that there's a proliferation of ethical codes, right? There is, you know, I can't remember how many hundreds, but there are sort of loads of ethical codes. And I just wondered what you thought about that. I mean, is it, you know, are you thinking about at some point there being some kind of global agreement or, you know, how do they function? And also, mm -hmm. I guess, whether you think, which you clearly do with the sense about, you know, we focus too much on ethics and, and, and not enough about power whether you know, too much energy is going in the direction of ethics codes. I mean, I wonder if you could elaborate your thoughts on that for us. Mm -hmm. There's quite mm -hmm. a few questions in the chat. I'm just sort of looking here about- um, Oh, amazing about questions. Yes, I'm very, I hope so. So I'd love yeah. to you know, tell us a bit more about that. Yes, and, and thank you for these questions. We'll certainly get to them in, in, in a moment. Um, allow me to just address that. In, in two ways. One is to say philosophically, obviously, you know, issues of ethics and power are always intertwined. Um, and we have, you know, decades, in fact, centuries of, of philosophy to point to exactly how that works. But in the book, what I'm referring to specifically is the way in which ethics codes have been used as a way to brush off regulation, as a way to say, we've got this, we'll have an ethics code, therefore we don't need any laws or sort of regulatory guardrails around how we're creating these systems or who they might be harming. And, and quite frankly, this isn't enough. And, and certainly while I think it is important to articulate forms of ethical principles in terms of how we design systems and deploy them, there is something much deeper, which is how do we actually make sure that these principles are accountable? What are the ways in which we can ensure that in fact, if something does go wrong, that this won't happen again and that there will actually be an account? So this is where I think regulation is, is far more necessary and certainly accounts of power, I, does this system actually give more power to the powerful? A, a system, you know, a question we should always ask of the systems we build. And also, what are the ways in which these systems actually speak to existing forms of power, be it 
capital, policing, the military, you name it. That to me is, is a much more useful lens than, than quite high level ethical statements around safety and you know, making sure that you know, we do no harm. Because again and again, we've seen how, again, these codes have actually not borne out with the reality. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting because there's such a kind of fashion in Silicon Valley for kind of user groups, UX groups, as if that's mm. as if that's the answer. You know, that you get some users in and and test something out, and it's such a kind of narrow um, context of use. Whereas you're kind of very much stressing that actually it's people who are affected by these technologies who should be the ones who are consulted and and you know participate in the design. And we've had a lot of movements in our in our circles for years about um, participatory design. Could you say something about that? Do you think that's an important mm. kind of element in all of this? Mm. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and certainly, you know, one of the things that I've worked on, as have many other scholars, uh, including people like Andrew Selbst, is this idea of impact assessments. You know, how would you actually yeah. have impact assessments where members of the community can have a say in whether a government will deploy a facial recognition system yeah. or, yeah. you know, a hiring AI system or a you know risk assessment system inside the criminal justice system, for example. These are many, many places at which you could actually have public debate and public decision making and also the ability to have a politics of refusal to be able to say no we don't want this system here we actually don't want this applied and and that is just one of many mechanisms that we could start to think of around participatory regulation so as you know in many cases laws have been you know informed and in some cases even partly written by technology companies and i think that's simply not going to get us where we need to go when we're starting to see you know such extraordinary power asymmetries between the tech sector and you know the populations that they serve so instead i think we need to think much more radically around how regulations are formed and the ways in which communities can have a say in the way that they're applied no, that's really interesting because, you know, the last conference I went to in Stanford was called, um, what was it, Coding for Care. And it was, a, you know, a discussion exactly about what elements of care for the elderly. It's always, you know, the discussions are always care, you know, the, but it's even right. posed as that, right? Um, and it's posed in terms of keeping individuals at home alone as long as possible and then thinking about systems that will operate. And... It's exactly sort of context like that where you really do want to step back and think, well, what do you want to use the technology for in a way and what, what isn't appropriate and where do we get guidelines to think that through? You know, do you have any exactly. sort of, yeah, do you have any views about the care issue? Well, I mean, I mean, care work is such an important question because again, it's been so central during the pandemic is to think about, yes. you know, what it is when we're isolated, you know, and, and again, the way in which the debates have said, how can automation get us out of this rather than thinking how might mutual aid be a much better framework? And the question here for me is, why do we always put technology at the center? Yeah. Why do we assume that technology is either going to be the, you know, the panacea or the problem rather than saying, why don't we actually think about this problem around what kind of world do we want to live in? What are the ways in which we increase Absolutely. equity and justice? And then how technology might serve that vision rather than driving it. I mean, there are so many ways in which, you know, the AI debate is frustrating because it keeps assuming that AI really can be applied to everything and anything. And it's always the first go-to approach rather than looking at the long histories of, you know, how do we actually produce the types of social change that people are calling for, well, it's very rarely just a tech fix. Oh, so I think that means that we're looking for different sorts of work. And again, this is where your work has been so important. Um, and I noticed that there's several questions in the chat, and, I, and I'm going to have to answer this, um, asking about the artwork of the book and the cover, which is just behind me right now. Um, but it also makes me think of how important artists are in oh. these sorts of discussions oh. as well. And, and, and again, the culture industries for telling different sorts of stories about how technology works and fails. So to answer your question in the chat about uh, this extraordinary image, it's by Vladan Jola, who I also collaborated with on a project called Anatomy of an AI System, where we came up with a gigantic map of a 
single Amazon Echo. Um, this cover image is actually one of many designs he has in the book illustrating ideas around the way in which, again, you can see from sort of the human head, ideas of intelligence and phrenology, to how we represent the world, to the planetary costs of large scale computational systems. So I, I really think his work is marvelous. So thank you for that question. Um, in fact, there's a field of amazing questions, Judy. I know, I, I know. I think we can get to all of them. <laughs> we absolutely can't. I've, I, I've just got two quickies. I mean, yeah, I'm looking at the Brilliant. clock. Can I just ask you two quickies? I mean, one is like, I can't help but ask you what the industry response has been like to the book. Because I see you, you, you know, you give it a talk at the Computer History Museum and to lots of different audiences. What's, what's been the response of the, of the tech community in a way? Well, it's interesting because I think certainly the way in which I wrote this book is, you know, if you think about it, it's 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 almost like geological strata. It's it's written almost as a sort of a full computational stack. You know, we start with the Earth, we look at labor, data, yeah. classification, yeah. the state, all the way up to outer space. And so, in that sense, I think yeah. for different different groups within the tech sector, they have different sorts of questions depending on what part of the problem they're addressing. So, for groups that are sort of working around large scale data analysis and prediction, issues around classification and bias are extremely timely right now. And, and people are seeking different ways of contending with this, because we know that certainly over the last few years, these problems are not going away. So we do need different ways of thinking. Then again, in other parts of the industry, and I find this really heartening, mm -hmm. there's a new set of conversations about how to reduce the energy intensiveness of machine learning approaches. Mm -hmm. That is still very new, but it's extremely exciting. We're seeing that there is a lot of waste there that can actually be improved upon, a lot of cycles that can actually be compressed and algorithmic techniques that will just be far less energy intensive. We're going to need that. You know, We're at a time of climate crisis. And so as a sector, I think there's a growing sense of concern and I think of responsibility. So, you know, in, in that sense, I, I've had really positive experiences and I think people are asking really good questions. But at the same time, you know, we are seeing, you know, a, a real sort of shift towards, you know, increasing the tools of uh, facial recognition, predictive policing, you know, there, there, are, there are lots of companies and sectors that won't find this book so edifying to their beliefs. Um, and certainly this is why I think it's important that we have these public debates now because these tools are being used in so many ways that I think many of us would find deeply concerning. I wanted to end by asking you, well, to say that it's, it's just so wonderful that women like you are at the forefront of these debates about bias in AI, you know, it's, and, and I wonder why you think that is, because of course, when I started working on gender and technology, certainly there were not a lot of um, women in the field. And now it's, it's very striking, actually, that many of the wonderful books that are coming out and the research that's being done is very much being led by um, women and feminists at the moment. So I wondered, you know, why do you think that is? Have you got a... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly interesting um, that, that we're seeing a far more sort of diverse coalition of people working on these issues, I think, than we have of people who are just working on algorithms. And, and that should tell us something in terms of who are the people who have experienced marginalization, yeah. ostracization, misrecognition by systems, are the people who are going to be very alert to these questions and will be asking, again, how do we improve these kinds of issues before they become more ingrained in our society? But also one of the things I like to do is to go back and to look at the very early years of artificial intelligence in the 1950s and 60s. And even back then, you know, you would have Margaret Mead, you know, on, on the same panel as, you know, Jeffrey Bateson. You'd have people who are actually designing systems um, sitting there with anthropologists who were thinking about their social implications. We lost that for a while there. And I think what we've seen is this kind of over prioritization of the technical and it's something that we really need to correct for now because these are no longer you know systems that are just being designed in labs or that are essentially you know theoretical interventions these are systems that are affecting billions of people around the world and in very different ways so what that means is that i think we have to start reconceptualizing ai as an interdiscipline and as one that has to be very much grounded in the communities who are being affected by the these tools Tools every day. So, so that is certainly something that I think is, is urgently needed for the next decade in this space.
Fantastic. Well, look, it, it, it's, um, it just leads me to congratulate you on the book. It is a fantastic book. I really recommend everyone read it. It's beautifully produced. It's very easy to read, clearly set out. I mean, it is a kind of wonderful job. I've got a champagne glass. Here. Oh. I'm going, we were going to have a... I'm very sorry that we, we can't have drinks because normally, normally... I'm sad about that too. We would go and have a drink. Um, <laughs> But I let let us have a let us have a little glass. Um, Judy, and, and congratulations! Thank you. It's a wonderful job. Thank you so much, and I I couldn't recommend the book more highly. Cheers! It means Cheers. so much to celebrate this with you and with everybody who's joined today. It's it's an extraordinary group, um, and I really hope that we can do this in person sometime. I hope so too. You know, vaccines willing. <laughs> Cheers! Thanks Cheers. again.